Welcome back to the Telecom TV Summit on 5G Evolution and our live Q&A show. I'm Guy Daniels, Director of Content, and this is the first of two live Q&A shows today. We have another one coming up in ooh, around about 90 minutes time. Plus, we've got a further live Q&A program for you tomorrow. So there is plenty of opportunity for you to quiz our panelists and guests. Now, we've just seen the panel discussion that looked at making the case for standalone 5G. And now we're going to expand on that and answer whatever questions you have, as well as dig a little deeper into the whole 5G area. And if you haven't yet sent in a question, then please do so now using the Q&A form on the website. And as always, your co-host for our live Q&A shows is Ray Lemaitre, Editorial Director here at Telecom TV. Now, Ray, standalone 5G, as we call it, was the original vision for 5G before operators in their infinite wisdom decided they wanted to accelerate its introduction by using 5G radio over LTE core. But it's taking a lot of time to get 5G standalone up and running. Have we perhaps underestimated the complexity? Well, Guy, yes, uh, I, I think there are a lot of moving parts here, not least uh, for some operators, the added challenge of running critical functions on public cloud platforms. And that's something that just doesn't happen overnight. Uh, and for many operators, there's been a lengthy evaluation process to see which standalone combination works best with their overall strategy. So, yeah, I think the complexity was perhaps underestimated. Uh, and this isn't a decision and deployment that should in any way be rushed, important as it is to get to, to market as quickly as possible. Yeah, indeed not. It really shouldn't be rushed, as you say. They, they've got to get this right first time. OK, let's now meet our guests who have returned to help answer all your questions. And joining us live on the programme today are Luis Fialo, who is Vice President of China Telecom Americas, Pedro Torres, CTO Europe Outdoor Wireless Networks at Comscope, and Grant Lenan, Partner and Principal Analyst with Apple Door Research. Hello everyone, welcome back. It really was a, a great panel discussion we had earlier, so let's now take a look at our audience questions as they come in. Ray, have you got our first one? Uh, yes, I do, Guy. Thanks very much. And uh, we've got a topical one to start with. And the question is, uh, this week, AT&T announced an expansion of its 5G standalone edge zones. And its group CTO, Jeremy Legg, said that the question he is most asked is, what is the 5G killer app? And his answer uh, apparently is always, too many, that there are too many to list. How would the panel answer that question? So essentially the question is, what is the 5G killer app? Uh, so uh, Lewis, um, perhaps we can start with you on this one. Um, yes, uh, hi everybody. Um, yes, yeah, so I, I sort of agree with his uh, overall assessment, but I have my own perspective as to what I think currently is the killer app. And that's really, uh, the integration of IoT technology, the sensors and stuff, and being able to pull that information um, because that's the impetus that really is driving a lot of these deployments and use, uh, especially in the business community. Uh, so for me, I would look at IoT as a, as a starting point of you know being the most prevalent, most critical component to gather that information and be able to bring it back in to uh, the corporate environment and then be able to Use it, use it across the cloud environment and so forth. Um, so, you know, that's where I think it's big, um, where everybody, based on my experiences and dealing with my customers, uh, where it all starts right now. Okay, excellent. Thanks, Lewis. Uh, and Grant, what would you say is the killer app for 5G, if there is one? Hello, everyone. Uh, I'd like to, you know, strongly support actually the contention that there isn't a single killer app. I think that's the key. There's two ways of looking at driving a platform or technology. There's the killer app model and there's the long tail model. And if you look at everything from YouTube to search engines to all sorts of things, the 
the long tail model where you have a huge number of smaller um, applications that, that lead to a large and distributed market has been the real driving force. And a couple of years ago, when there was a lot of hype over things like self-driving cars needing uh, 5G and such, we did some primary and secondary market research on industrial automation and published it. And what was really fascinating in there is that some of the most touted, quote, killer apps were, to be generous, um, future opportunities. But what we found, surprisingly, because I went from being a skeptic to being a big supporter, was that there were a large number of applications that were admittedly less exciting, but also clearly more profitable. And they were things like automating uh, ports and mines and rail yards. And rather than super low latency, direct control of machines in factories, it was things like monitoring sensors and improving uh, the detection of, of wear and, and being able to trend machine tools for tool replacement. Um, these may not be the most exciting things in the world, but they can cut maintenance costs and improve quality dramatically. Uh, and that's tremendously important. So I think you know one of the key things is you need to be putting together an infrastructure that can be taken in different directions by industries, by systems integrators, and by you know customers that have somewhat unique ideas. And you know, to Lewis's point, a lot of that is going to be quote things. Yeah, absolutely. And um, you know, there is great expectation uh, of being able to connect many more of these things with the 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 full fat flavor of five G, if we can uh, call it that. Probably can't, but I just did. Uh, okay, um, Guy, I think that now it's time to move on to our second audience question of the day. Yeah, thank you, Ray. And uh, Ray, do you remember when the killer app was uh, being able to check your stock prices on your mobile? <laughs> Not much good if you didn't have any stocks, though. Anyway, we've moved on a yeah, long didn't way help. since they all went down. on mobile. <laughs> <laughs> they only move one direction. Right now, we've got a, a great question in here from, uh, yeah, it's from a tier three operator, uh, which I think is really indicative of the concerns of the wider telecoms community. And the, and the question is, is it possible to realize 5G core from virtual EPC without completely dismantling it and swapping it out? So really sounds like, you know, the question is asking, can you simply upgrade the software on your VEPC or do you need you know, to get the forklift trucks in and, and, and do some really heavy lifting here? Um, Grant, do you think we could uh, start by uh, getting your views on, on this one and then helping our uh, questioner out? I think we need to start out with the question, just because you could doesn't mean you should. Uh, sh you know, should you do that? First of all, the uh, moving to a 5G standalone core is much more than just upgrading some protocols. It is a uh, much flatter uh, architecture. It is designed to be much lower latency, completely IP native, and most important, far more distributed. And I, I want to poke into the far more distributed. Um, our research, and this is something else we're actually doing research on right now, uh, being led by my colleague Robert, who was part of the panel as well, um, is that if you look at the drivers for 5G standalone core, a lot of these are going to be uh, industrial applications driven by industries. Uh, they may very well require some additional information or functionality from the network or put into the network. Uh, and having a cloud native core that is very modular and allows for some functionality that we cannot even anticipate back to the killer app question. We don't necessarily know exactly what it will be in, say, auto manufacturing versus security versus something else uh, is going to be critical. And so I do believe it is going to be an extensive rethinking of how you build the core, not upgrading a few modules. Uh, more importantly, as you move to a cloud native distributed design, uh, there are a lot of operational testing and assurance uh, changes that are gonna, going to be made and going to be necessary. Uh, so this is something that should probably be done um, with a bunch of planning and, and incrementalism, uh, not because we want to be slow, but because we want to get the business benefits, not merely check off that we meet some protocol standard. 
Great. Thanks so much, Grant. Yeah, as you say, it's more than just updating some protocols. There's a, there's a lot more work seems to be involved um, than that. Any of our other guests want to come in with some, some comments uh, uh, about the complexity, I guess, of uh, moving to, to 5G core? Otherwise, if not, we will, we will uh, leave it with, with Grant's thoughts there and um, move on to one well, of the other questions could, because we are if, getting a, a lot of questions in. Ray? If I could... Yeah, if I could just follow on quickly with a, a quick thought for, for Grant there then, because, um, you know, th this, this question has come from, from an operator, which is clearly uh, not particularly, it sounds like they don't particularly want to do this uh, full, full change, this full forklift upgrade. But once operators get to a distributed cloud native 5G standalone core, is, is this going to be something that they'll be able to rely on and and use uh, a platform they'll be able to use for a long time and not be thinking, well, we're just going to go have, have to go through another entire change of our core platform um, in five years time? Is this something that's going to be a lot more future proof, do you think? Um, I, I think we need to look at it two ways. First of all, I think the short answer is yes, because moving to a IP native and cloud native core is going to be critical for a lot of the future technologies that we see in, in industrial applications, if and when the metaverse comes along, which is going to take time. But that is one of those things that could be uh, forecast into the future. Um, on the other hand, I, I want to caution that we shouldn't feel that there is a need to jump quickly. Uh, I think we can look at 5G, the radio side of things, uh, that can be you know, supported adequately with a non-standalone core. And 5G, the core side of things, as serving two different objectives. One is serving the constant progression of radio density and efficiency improvements that has taken us from the earliest days of cellular to today. The other is really the moving to the standalone core, at least in our view, is really about new industrial use cases and the ability to take advantage of the modularity, the RIC and things like that uh, to be able to uh, address these use cases. So if you're really addressing the evolution of the mass market uh, broadband on mobile devices, you know, handheld phones and small uh, medium business devices, uh, there's probably not a huge reason to jump quickly. And yet when you do make the change, I think you can feel fairly confident that now with a cloudified core, that that incremental upgrade you were looking for is going to be easier because now you can do a CI CD change to that functional functionality that changes without necessarily having to upgrade and reintegrate the pieces that haven't changed. At least that is the theory. Okay, brilliant, Grant. Thanks very much, and and, and great points there. Yes, uh, and of course, as we know, uh, theory is one thing; uh, practice can sometimes turn out to be another. Um, okay, at this point, I think uh, Guy will probably move on to uh, to the next uh, question, audience question, um, and this one is, uh, um, and the question is. 3GPP release 17, which has just been frozen and stabilized, uh, offers full 5G capabilities, both for the enterprise and the consumer market. But when will corresponding products and services, uh, the enabling smartphones, the supporting equipment, the vertical applications, be commercially available in the market? So I guess the, the question is uh, here, This this grand new vision uh, or the ultimate vision of 5G as envisaged back in the in uh, a few years ago. When is this actually, when are all the pieces going to be in place to enable this to become a reality? Uh, uh, Pedro, maybe we can start uh, with you on this one. How close are we to the full 5G that, that everybody's been hoping for? Yeah, I think, um, you know, to, maybe to keep the, uh, the answer short, typically we see that all these features and devices and uh, opportunities arise six to 12 months after the specs are frozen and released. And so if you think about such a complex ecosystem, it's going to take time. Um, but um, I'm very confident that uh, 
very short uh, very shortly we will start seeing uh, the the release 17 being supported by the run vendors and the epc vendors sorry the, the core vendors and so on um so the, that will be the first uh, the first step and then uh, right after that we will start seeing all the applications that can make use of of these uh, capabilities so uh, six to 12 months that's the typical cycle after the the specs are frozen and released okay so uh, perhaps not too long to wait there um to to, to get the the full flavor of 5g um anybody else want to to come in and, and comment on these uh, time scales for the uh, for the audience uh, question uh if not uh, Oh, I beg your pardon, Lewis. Sorry. Uh, please go ahead. Uh, no problem. No, I I, um, I agree with the comment that my colleague uh, just made, but I also starting to see that the challenge that the, our industry is facing with as far as deploying of all this is that um, you, you're bringing together different technologies to utilize 5G to be able to you know to really get robust use of it and the best use of it but the uh, the reality is that some of the, we're starting to see businesses that are adopting some of this technology i would say in china um you know uh, we've seen a tremendous uptake on the manufacturing industry to be able to utilize 5g technology just on the radio side to utilize it on their campus, to be able to communicate and everything else. In the United States, we started to see uh, a couple of weeks ago, the city of Las Vegas announced their 5G initiative through a couple of partnerships, and they're going to be able to start developing. That's a government led initiative that's gonna push this and enable businesses to be able to utilize 5G, okay, as this network is deployed. Most recently, uh, this week, Mars, uh, you know, the candy company out of the U.S., they they talked about how they're using 5G on their manufacturing plants to be able to sort of utilize not only IoT technology that they've had in the past, but their, their AI technology in the manufacturing process, which is really, uh, you know, accelerated and better utilized because of the use of the, you know, the inherent benefits of 5G, you know, the speed, the clarity, the amount of bandwidth it's going through. So what I'm getting at is that uh, as a carrier, you want to be able to de develop it and deploy it and, you know, get out there as much as possible. But at the same time, you want to have businesses that are wanting to go ahead and start making those investments uh, to be able to utilize their either their existing infrastructure or migrate to a new platform where they can use 5G, and that's going to you know it's it's a uh, you know it's, it takes time, and for full deployment, I think you're starting to see that uh, prevail in you know converse, conferences like this one. You know, it will help educate people and it will actually help uh, you know propagate the use of 5G on a more uh, uh, global basis and a, a local basis, which would then also, you know, encourage uh, further investment and faster deployment of this technology. So it's, you know, it's a chicken or egg thing, right? So that's where we're at right now, in my view. Uh, but I'm very, uh, you know, optimistic of the uptake that I'm starting to see of different deployments that are being done. Okay, excellent. Yeah, of course, investment cycles are are, are tricky things to, to, to move around. Uh, uh, I guess, especially at the moment as well, with um, you know uh, capital, uh, the cost of capital not being quite the same as it was a, a year or two years ago. Uh, when you mentioned Mars, there, I thought you were going to start uh, telling us that Elon Musk was planning a five G standalone network uh, in outer space, but that proved not to be the case. So uh, I thought I'd missed a, a big news story there, but uh, obviously not. Okay, uh, Guy, I think uh, time to move on to the to the next part of the program. Yep, thank you very much, Ray. Um, before we do, though, we've just got a, a, a question in based on, on the answers we've just heard. So maybe it's quite timely if I just jump in oh. with, with this point. It's not so much a, a question, it's more of a Good. statement from one of our audience members here. Um, and then just picking up there on the, the timescales after standardisation, you know, six or 12 months after standardisation's finalised, we're, we're going to get, hopefully, devices and services in the field. Um, the, the, the questioner mentions that, well, you know, with release 16, the previous release, for example, it's, it's taken a lot longer for, for this to be introduced commercially. So, you know, is it, is it a case that we can be a bit optimistic or overly optimistic at times 
uh, between standards being finished and getting commercial products and services into the market. And, you know, if that's the case, is there anything we can do to speed up the process and, and, and get them get them into into service faster? Um, you know, Pedro, if I could just come back to you, because you, you, you mentioned the standardization process in your answer there. Is there, is there anything we can do to accelerate this? Well, I think that's that's a very good question. And the the um, most important thing we can do, of course, is that we have a lot of interest from different industries and, and potential new customers and, um, and and ideas on how to use these capabilities. So as uh, some of my colleagues uh, in in the in this uh, panel mentioned, we have lots of interest from from many different new potential uh, customers and users of the technology in verticals, in uh, manufacturing, and so on. And the fastest way to introduce in the technology is when you have lots of potential customers looking to implement it in, in their network. So, so all this, of course, requires a lot of learning. So there's a learning process in how to use the, the technology. I think that that is what we are seeing right now. People are starting to realize on how to best use 5G capabilities. Uh, now, as we start introducing 5G standalone, they will learn more about the new opportunities that uh, this technology uh, brings. So that's taking time. I agree. Um, sometimes more than time, more time than than what we would like to to see. But the the final uh, situation when we have all these features and and uh, capabilities implemented in networks will be that we can address so many more use cases than what we have been able so far. So I'm still very positive about the implementation and the deployment of all these features. Great, thanks very much, Pedro. Yeah, as, as you say, we, we, we need more customers. We need to get the knowledge out there and, and get uh, its capabilities known more. Uh, Lewis, let's come across to you for some uh, extra comments on this question we just had in. Yeah, I, actually, I just want to add on to what Pedro just said. You know, um, one of the things that my company is doing is we're starting to educate our sales organization, our sales engineers and our solutions engineers to be able to understand how to utilize this technology. We obviously are selling this solution inside of China, but we're selling it out of the America's region, right? So, you know, it's it's a it not only is the challenge to get it out and utilize it, right, but it's also a challenge to uh, teach our people, you know, how to use it, you know, to show the ROI, you know, because it's not, it's not like a solution where you're just connecting one location to another location. It's actually a solution where you have to understand, you know, what your customer's doing and uh, have a deeper understanding of what their customer's doing and then be able to deploy the right solution. You know, it's, it's a lot of, uh, uh, handholding and education that needs to start with, you know, uh, inside of a corporation that goes out and, and have people that be evangelists to push this uh, technology. And I think with that deployment and that acceptance, I think you'll start seeing a greater uptake of, uh, of people willing to do stuff and try new trials and uh, proof of concepts and so forth. Great, Lewis. Thanks very much for that. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks to uh, our audience member for sending in that question, just proving it's a live Q&A show and we respond as quickly as we can um, and we make it as interactive as we can. Uh, Ray, I think we should uh, go on to the, the next part of the program. Um, so let's have a look, a first look at the audience poll for our 5G Evolution Summit. One question seven answer options and you can pick whichever ones you feel are the most relevant and the question we've been asking this week is which technologies and capabilities are most needed for optimized 5g systems and you can see the real-time votes right here now no they don't add up to 100 percent, and that's because you can vote for as many as you like it's all multiple choice but it's an interesting mix there. Um, everything from uh, cloud native and power consumption scoring highly right the way down to the metaverse. It's, a, it's a quite a wide mix. Now, if you've yet to vote, then please do so because we always get a surge in votes during the summit and these numbers are likely to change by the end of tomorrow. Now, if I look at the clock, we've still got another, what, 15 minutes or so remaining on this show. So there's plenty of time for more questions. Uh, but first of all, over to you, Ray. Yeah, thanks, Guy. Um, so just looking at those uh, poll results, I'm just interested to know what uh, what our panelists uh, today uh, think, because 
for me, quite interesting and, and quite surprising to see uh, energy efficiency actually gaining uh, the most votes there, even more so than uh, cloud native capabilities. Uh, and also quite surprised as well to see with so much talk about the metaverse uh, and extended reality, uh, that's got the least support for those kind of uh, uh, experiences and applications, has got the least number of, of votes uh, in this poll. So I wonder, uh, any, anybody on our panel here today got any thoughts? Uh, are these the kind of results you, you might have expected? Any surprises? OK, Grant, we'll start with you and then we'll come up to Pedro. I'll keep it short and say I'm actually not surprised at all. And I think uh, the high rating of power and efficiency and the lower rating of the meta metaverse and, and a, a, not AI, but uh, virtual reality solutions are showing exactly the same thing, which is timeliness. Um, my take is uh, virtual reality will be very important someday, right? But that day is not today. And yet, uh, one of the things as we look at modern equipment and data centers, uh, one of the largest costs in them is power. And the more power you use, the more you know HVAC you use to evacuate the building, unless this is stuff that's out at a cell site and is you know air cooled. Um, and so, I think this reflects an interest in what is impacting decision makers today. Uh, the one that I probably would just encourage the whole industry to think more about is the cloud native piece, because the quicker we move to cl cloud native, uh, the quicker we have the ability to add innovative industry vertical specific functionality uh, into it. And to an uh, 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 earlier question from a viewer uh, on how do I upgrade, the quicker we get to cloud native, the uh, more surgical upgrades can be and less of a forklift. So cloud native, I think, has a lot of long term value. Uh, but once again, it's that word long term. And uh, I think decision makers may be worrying about today first and get to tomorrow tomorrow. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, great point. I mean, cloud native was the one I did expect to see uh, top of the pile there. But like, like you say, uh, uh, there isn't anything more uh, front of mind for everybody at the moment other than uh, energy efficiency. Uh, uh, Pedro, or what are your thoughts here? Any any surprises, shocks uh, from this uh, this um, audience poll? No, I'm I'm not surprised at all. Um, if if we look uh, at the metaverse part, for instance, I think there is a clear lack of understanding uh, of what that means and uh, more importantly, how that can affect or impact our, our business. So I don't think mobile operators uh, or the mobile industry really know um, how this will fi eventually evolve and how uh, these uh, new services or the metaverse as a whole will, uh, will impact the connectivity. Um, so that it remains to be seen. We are seeing some operators that are now starting to try to lear learn uh, from from uh, some uh, specific use cases uh, from the metaverse, but uh, it's a long way to go before before we know that for sure. Uh, and then energy savings. Um, I look at it um, and I am kind of in agreement with Grant. I think this is a short term um, problem. I mean, not a short term problem. This is a problem that is hurt, hurting the business right now. So in each and every meeting that we have with uh, with mobile operators, uh, energy uh, consumption becomes one of the first topics that uh, we discuss. Um, and uh, this is part of the whole sustainability agenda that um, the mobile industry as a whole is, is um, trying to address. Um, it's not only the, uh, the fact that um, a significant part of the OPEX uh, of mobile operators comes from energy consumption. And now with the energy uh, prices going up, it's even more problematic. And as I say, it's really hurting the, the business uh, these days. Um, it's not only that, but also governments are now starting to look as to how industries uh, use power. And in some instances, in some cases, even mandating a more uh, efficient way of, of using power uh, in the European Union and, and, and some other places, uh, we are expected to reduce our overall energy consumption <clears throat> going forward. Um, so that's that's another important aspect. And then the whole society is more aware of of uh, that we have to be 
to build more sustainable a more sustainable society and building more sustainable networks is going to be one of the uh, top objectives going forward not only for the next phases of 5g but equally so looking into the 6g era um, sustainable networks is is a key priority uh, for 3pp and for for the whole industry yeah absolutely yeah it's not just lip service uh, anymore for that uh, and a great point you make there uh, about the metaverse and in fact just today the telecom infra project uh, tip uh, announced the formation of a a metaverse focused project group uh, to figure out you know how mo mobile operators need to to, to think about these uh, applications and experiences and what impact it will have on the network. What they didn't say though, whether, whether, is whether that project group will meet in person or meet virtually. A question for another day uh, to be answered there. Uh, okay, Guy, um, the clock is ticking, I know. Have we got time for any more audience questions? Oh yes, sir. I think I think we do. And uh, that that uh, tip question, we can put it to tip next week because the the fuse event in in Madrid, and we're going to be along there. If any of our audience are there, please pop by and say hello. Uh, yes, uh, another question in here, and let's put this to to um, all of our guests. Uh, the question is: Is there any benefit to a multi-vendor five G standalone core? Or is it best just to source everything from one single trusted supplier? Okay, so variation of a question we've, we've, we've seen a few times before here, but it's, it's so, so important. It's on the minds of a lot of operators, obviously, as evidenced by that question there. Um, any of our guests want to um, weigh in on this one about whether we should go with a, a multi-vendor 5G SA or, or just, just go with a one single supplier who's trusted and uh, has a lot of track record? Any, uh, any, anyone to want to take this one, or is it going to, is it going to stump the panel? It's the question. Oh, great stuff, great stuff. Thank you, Grant. I'll, I'll start it rolling. But again, I want to look to my colleagues who have hands-on experience here. But I think the multi-vendor uh, versus single vendor is again a trade-off of today versus tomorrow. I think, particularly with cloud-native standalone cores, one of the opportunities is that. Uh, there may be innovation from one vendor in one function and from another vendor in another function. And companies will want the ability to take advantage of that. So multi-vendor is a great advantage over the long run, even more so in a cloudified uh, standalone core than in, in other systems where multi-vendor is a nice competitive angle. Uh, I think the flip side is on your first stand-up, probably risk reduction and simplification are high priorities and operators will probably want to uh, limit the complexity possibly to one initially. Um, but I'd be really curious what uh, my colleagues uh, have to say on that as well. Thank you, Grant. Uh, and uh, Lewis, let's, uh, let's, let's hear from you now and uh, see what you, indeed, what you have to say on this subject. Uh, yeah, uh, I completely agree with Grant that, you know, the, the deployment of, you know, 5G and the utilization inside your, uh, you know, your digital uh, ecosystem, you know, it's complicated enough, right? Uh, to have multi-vendors, uh, I think in the short term is probably not the right uh, strategy because you'll just make things much more complicated. But I think over time, as the technology becomes more mature and the utilization and how it's utilized inside your corporation is much more better understood, not only by yourself, but your vendor, I think it makes total sense uh, to have multi-vendor uh, because it, things happen, right? The networks are not always 100% foolproof. And although um, we, we, we all aspire to make sure it works 100%, uh, there are challenges. Um, so, you know, maybe it's a, uh, maybe you're forced to do some of that multi-vendor because of geographic constraints. You know, your, your partner here in, the, in one part of the world doesn't have the same capabilities in the other part, doesn't have the other ecosystem that you need. Because the reality is we're talking about utilizing technology um, that is, you know, you're still working in a global uh, setting for most companies, right? Uh, their manufacturing centers may be in Asia, their, uh, you know, their IT development is in the, in the States or in Europe, you know, so these are, these are challenges that you, you face and you're going to have to make those decisions. But 
like Grant said, uh, keeping it simple in the early stages is going to be critical because you want to be able to show how it works. And you, you have a lot of hurdles to overcome already if you are, uh, and you would just make it more complex and more difficult if you were to try to tackle it from the beginning from, with multi vendors. Oh, yes. Interesting points there, Lewis. Thanks very much. Great points from, on, uh, from both of you there on that answer. Um, I'm speeding up a little bit because I see we've got about four minutes of the program left. So, um, Ray, I think we can squeeze in one more viewer question, I think. Yes. Uh, and a question has come in during the course of the program. So uh, very quickly, I'll, I'll try and distill it here. And the question is, um, uh, uh, there's a lot of talk about 5G. There are 5G services in a lot of places but not everywhere and not every operator has built out a, a full 5G network yet. Is this because it's more difficult than the operators thought and maybe more expensive? And is there are there any major challenges that the operators still haven't figured out yet in terms of 5G rollout? Um, so uh, that's the question, I guess, about whether 5G is a, a little bit more tricky. Uh, Pedro, yes, can we come to you on this one? Yeah, I think um, if if we look at the, the complexity of introducing the new technology, um, it became very clear from from the beginning that going from 4G to 5G non-standalone would be, I wouldn't say like a, an easy task, but uh, much easier than going from uh, 3G to 4G, and from uh, 4G to 5G standalone. And, and that is that complexity of migrating for from a 4G network to a 5G standalone network. That is, I think, why why we are seeing um, that operators are not, um, you know, maybe going as, with the speed that uh, that everyone hoped for. Um, so that complexity is the number one, um, the number one thing. And then number two is the business part. So are we ready to? monetize the 5G standalone deployments um, uh, in the industry. That is the second question mark that some operators may may wonder, right? Is this, this the right moment? Should I wait 12 more months? Um, that This is the type of discussion that uh, I see them having internally as to when, when is the right moment to make the move? Do they gain a, a competitive advantage if they go first? Um, and these are, you know, the typical questions that, that we, we see in the operator community as to when to make the move to what I would call the real 5G, uh, the 5G standalone, where you have all the capabilities and uh, that were slicing and, and the features that are needed to, to make, um, to monetize the, the, the 5G technologies. Okay, excellent. Uh, uh, thank you. And, and Lewis, you wanted to come in very quickly on this before we have to close out the program. Yeah, uh, just quickly, I want to tell you that the reason you see so different pockets of the world uh, having 5G further along than other pockets in the world, uh, the rest of the world, is it's also besides what Pedro just mentioned, which is really important. It's also the regulatory situations that you face in different countries. You know, they haven't some of these things. You know, haven't been thought out by the regulators and the governments, and even the spectrum of what they're going to use and how they're going to use it, and who's going to get access to it, or even if there's going to be a shared platform that everybody's going to have access to it. These are debates that are still being done at the government level. That's going to take time for some countries to catch up on and do so. Um, so I think you know, and I also agree with Pedro that you know the biggest issues right now is the, you know, when do you, how much do you want to invest. Um, versus, you know, what are you going to get in return? Because at the end of the day, a lot of these investments are for commercial reasons. So, um, you know, you have to balance that out. Yeah, no, absolutely, of course. And that's a great point. And that's why we're only just seeing the launch of 5G in the second largest market in the world, India, right now, because the, the licenses were only issued uh, a few months ago. Uh, OK, Guy, I think the, the, the red light in our uh, virtual studio is blinking uh, frantically. Um, so uh, I'll hand over to you to, to close out the show, I think. Yeah, thank you very much, Ray. And a really good point to end what was a terrific discussion on there. So uh, thank you to all of our guests who joined us for this live program. And of course, to our audience for sending in their questions. Uh, we still have several remaining, which we will try and get to later today.
That's right. So do remember to send in your questions for the live Q&A show as soon as you can. Don't leave it too late. The next live show is coming up very shortly. And don't forget the poll question. There's still time for you to have your say and influence the outcome of that poll. So vote now. Yes, vote now. And please join Ray and me again in about 40 minutes time, right after our panel on telco strategies for supporting private 5G. That's coming up soon. And that will be the final live Q&A show of today. But for now, goodbye. <laughs>